Okay. Oh, it's coming. Oh, there we go. All right. So, as he said, my name is Ryan Holderness. I'm with the Cameron. Um, I was hired on back when it was Union Electric. Um, I've been working in the environmental field for the past 42 plus years, uh, doing remediation on these sites for about the past 10 or 12 years. Um, so, what I come to talk to you about is the Edwardsville Manufactured Gas Plant project that we're doing right now that's on Union Street. Um, just south of the main drag here, Main Street. Um, on to that, but first, before we get into that, what I'd like to do is talk to you a little bit about what is manufactured gas and why did it come about? Um, so basically manufactured gas was invented in 19, 1795. It was invented by an Italian fireworks person that was trying to figure out a new way to illuminate the houses without candles. And so it was invented back in 1795. There were several different people that did work on it. <clears throat> and in 1816, I have to get my dates right. In 1816 in Baltimore, the first plant was designed, constructed, and operated. So that started us in the era of the gas lights, which you can see one over here on the right. And it eventually turned into residential gas lighting and residential cooking, as we know it today for the gas. So it's because of the demand and everything, it developed between 1850 and 1876 with all the inventions of the lights and everything else. Expanded in 1877. Um, just due to industrial taking over and wanting this in their industrial plants. And it led to part of the industrial revolution that we have. Um, it peaked in 1901 and, and then started to decline in 1930. The decline of it was after World War I, a lot of the petroleum gas lines that were built to support the war effort were converted over and allowed us to have a nice network to get what we know now as natural gas. So that was what kind of taking it over in the, in the past. They start shutting down these plants in 1940 to 1950. And then by 1950, there was no more manufactured gas plants operating in the United States. So what happened to these plants? These plants were all just basically abandoned, knocked down, left in place, whatever they were done. In 1965, the Illinois EPA, not in the Midwest, but on the East Coast, started to see chemicals that were related to MGP manufacturing present in the groundwater. And that's what started this whole remediation program coming up. Uh, so remediation has been going on at all the different sites across the United States since 1965. And we expect that there's about 50,000 MGP sites in the US that, need to, that needed to be remediated during this time. So just to give you an overview of the MGP process um, real quickly. So the coal come in, it was basically put into what's called the generator house, which is basically an oven that was oxygen deprived. The idea behind it was to get the coal not to combust, but to force to give off its gases that, could, that were basically a flammable or volatile organics. It then was cooled the gases, they put them into a condenser, and the tar trap, and out of that, they went to a purifier, then out to a gas holder, and out. The problem with it is all the way through these, this tar followed through and is now in these gas holders. And that's what a lot of sites are seeing their problem is with the gas holders. At Edwardsville, it's actually this burger right here, this cosmic station. The gas holders were all clean. So on there, there was three different types. So coal carbonization, which is basically the one that we see a lot around the Midwest. We did see carbureted water gas that come in in about 1918. And then they come up with oil gas later on. And what oil gas did for them was that basically was used in areas that didn't have coal or access to coal. But it's all basically the same process. So I know you can't see this, but this is all the stuff that comes off of the coal when you do this. And in there, 
we get the coal gases, which they burn, the lighting oil. But then when you get down to the center, see the one that says coal tar? Look at all of those things that fall underneath that coal tar. Those are all the things that we're dealing with now. So to give you an idea, this is what coal tar looks like when you dig it up out of the ground. It's kind of a brown, gooky, messy stuff. Uh, we've actually seen it where it's been in a liquefied form and it just pours out of the ground. It's just like pouring oil onto the ground. Uh, but basically the things we're concerned about is the aromic hydrocarbons, which are phenols and creosote, um, the B-texas, which are the big hitters, which is benzene, toluene, exyl, ethanol benzene, and xylene. And then we got some of the other ones, which are not nearly as bad. PA, PAHs are one we also see a lot at the sites. So we got all this material and we got all this work ahead of us. How do we do that? Well, Illinois was really great. Well, first, let me tell you. So here's Amron in here. And we have 55 MGP sites in Amron territory. Currently, 10 of them are active. Next week, there'll be 11 because I just got off a call to start another one next week. We received 39 no further remediation letters, which I'll get into in a minute for 27 MGP sites. The reason why we have more letters than we do MGP sites is letters are given out by parcels. So an overview of what happened. So we went out, we identified the sites. This happened in about 1990s for most of the Ameren facilities and the Illinois facilities on this side. We, these sites, once they're identified, we've enrolled them in, in what's called the EPA site remediation program. And if you want more information, go out and just type in IEPA um, site remediation program, and it'll give you all sorts of more information I'm doing here. It's a voluntary cleanup program, so we don't have to join it. We don't want to. Amherst took on the perspective that we want a clean environment just like everybody else. So we are voluntarily cleaning up these sites under the guidance of IEPA. What it does for us, it provides us with reviews and evaluations as we go through the whole process. So from start identifying the site till we finish and get a no further remediation letter, all the way through that, IEPA is involved with us. We have project managers, we talk to them weekly. Uh, the program is flexible, which we'll go into more on this site, because this is one of our more flexible sites for us because of the conditions. And at the end, these are the four reports that we have to submit to them for them to review and comment on as we go through the different phases. So now everybody's saying, okay, well, yeah, you're out cleaning this, it's voluntary, how do you recover the cost? So under the ICC environmental rider, we can recover third-party costs associated with cleanup the site. So that allows us to, to recover costs for our contractors. My personal cost is O&M for Ameren, Illinois. So it's just another thing, just like a lineman or anybody else out there. That's where my costs go into. What you want to do is if you look at the bottom of your bill, there's an environmental search, excuse me, environmental surcharge that covers the cost of these projects. And every month that comes up on your bill and it may vary from month to month because it's all depending on what our budget is for the following month. So if our budget on these sites go up and down, you'll see that number go up and down on your bill. Eventually we're hoping by the end of 2023, early 2024, that that number is zero. That's our goal. So here's small pictures of the MGP facility back in the 1920s. So here's the MGP building that all of you were familiar with. It's standing until I decided to take it down. And this is the holder right here. And in front, right here in the ground is where that tar separator is. That, again, is our problem child for this site. So it's a former MGP site. It's at 27, 270 West Union. It's approximately two and a half acres. We are going to clean up 
because of contamination, 1.6 of those two and a half acres. The rest of the acreage is far enough away that it was not impacted by the operation of the facility. <laughs> It was constructed in 1912 and only operated for four years, which was an advantage because we don't have a lot of contamination in the ground. The property was sold in 1942. At that point in time, it became a foundry supply store and it stayed a foundry supply store and other supply type businesses until about 1978, 1980. And then it was purchased and it was used then as a sign and paint decorative center, and then it went into residential apartments. Um, Ameren repurchased the property in 2020. Uh, we started the process in 2021, and if you remember the first process is to go out and do a site investigation. So we started that in 2021. We anticipate that all remediation will be done on the site by the end of this year. So what did we find? So we found some soil impacts. And as we go through here, the way the whole system works, it's based on exposure pathways. So if the pathway doesn't exist, or you can prevent that pathway from existing on your site, you no longer have that risk of exposure from that pathway. So that's what we were looking at. What are our pathways and what are our restrictions? All these impacts, are related back to governance that's given us in the regulations by the Illinois EPA. They're called remedial objectives. In case you hear that word, that's what they are. Remedial objectives is what levels we have to be in the ground which have de been deemed safe for continuous occupancy, depending on what it is. For residential, that's what it is. Construction worker, that notification is a little bit different. That's for somebody that's coming out and digging up your sewer line. So if he's digging up the sewer line, he's gonna go down into the soil. He needs to know in advance that we clean the soil up, but it, it's, it was there. So that's what that is. So we had that on the soil pack impact, both on the upper zero to three feet and then the deeper impact zone, which goes down to 10 feet or below. We did groundwater, groundwater impacts were kind of sparse again on the site with the wells we put in but they were definitely could be co-located with the soil contamination that we saw on the side. So on vapor impacts, again, we had a bunch of that that was over here around this building. It was mostly chloroform. So we think it probably was due to probably early 1400s, whatever, a herbicide or a pesticide or something like that that was put on the ground that probably contained chloroform. It also was in building material in the 1970s and 1980s. And if that building material was left on the ground, that core form will reach out into the ground. So we, we're gonna be taking care of that too. Structure related, the main building here, it looked really sound until we got into it. So one of our bigger problems we had with it is the type and age of foundation. It was a dry stack block foundation with no mortar in it and we needed to dig up next to it. What we found out later when we were tearing the building down was the outside of the building brick facade looked really great, but the interior brick walls, the mortar from the 1830s had all deteriorated really bad and that the walls just come down when we touched them. I mean, once we got the facade off the outside. So back line is it was a good idea to take the building down because it probably would have fell down while we were out there working on it. The shed, which was right here, that building had rotted floors. You couldn't walk in it uh, because the floors and also all the support posts that went up to support this floor had been eaten by termites. So both of those were removed just to get the safety hazard off of the site. So here's our remediation. So remember when I told you that they were flexible due to site conditions and what other things they have. So in our case, we have contamination that's just slightly above our medial objectives, but it's very deep in the soil. It's below, most of it is below 10 feet. There are some at zero to three feet, but most of those are heavy metals, which are typical that you find in, in even residential soil of your houses and stuff, just because they're natural occurring. So what we proposed and got approved last week by the Illinois EPA was this alternate banner. So we basically are doing a native soil, and then over top of that, 
we're putting what's called Bentomat. And Bentomat is a mat that doesn't allow vapors or moisture to penetrate through it either direction. And then we'll put 30 inches of soil, clean soil, which will be better than the soil you have in your front yard because we have to meet <coughs> residential objectives for that. And then we'll put, you know, six inches of topsoil so we can plan on that, um, onto that as we go along. The other thing that we did was on the uh, northwest corner, let's see if I go back. So on the northwest corner up here, this used to be a, rain a railroad trestle that run across. And I don't know if any of you have seen it, but it was like this when it come off the edge of it towards the uh, MCT trail that runs next to our property. So we are pulling all that back and bringing it back down to three to one slope so that it's not an erosion concern and also it's easier to maintain in the future. So all that work we're doing out there right now. So this will corner here will look a lot different once the fence comes down than what it did when the fence went up. Don't want anybody to be surprised. But the reason for doing that is for that. <clears throat> so we're working on remediation right now. The people are probably out there working today since we haven't paying rain for a while. We're trying to get the site right out so we can move forward. We're also getting some deliveries today. But one of the things, the reason why we picked this remediation is when we go and look at how to remediate things and how to fix it, we look at what its impact is on the communities, on the social life and everything else around there. One of the concerns we had was if we dug down and just in these spots and picked all the stuff up, you would be seeing 13 to 14 semi truck loads of dirt coming off of that site every day for about three months. How many people want that driven down the street? I live and I don't particularly care for it and we don't need it. So we look at alternatives and that's where the flexibility comes in with this. And this was the best alternative for this site just based on what the conditions were and where the impacts were on there. So it, we do look at social sustainability, all those different impacts as we go through social economics and all that. So post remediation. So post remediation will be probably towards the end of the year. We'll submit documents to the IPA for no further remediation letter, which is basically our final document saying, yeah, we said we were gonna do this. This is what we did. This is all the samples that were taken. This is all the data for the soil that we put back in. It's all good, you know, all that stuff to them. Once they get that, they'll provide us with a no further remediation letter. What that no further remediation letter is, it's attached to the deed of the property. And it basically says, that the property was cleaned up to meet the environmental specifications based on these restrictions. Right now, the restrictions on future land development, there will be a building restriction, so you would not be able to put a basement, you would not be able to build subgrades. So you could do a slab structure on it if you wanted to, although you have to be very careful with the footings because you only have three feet to work with. Um, groundwater use restrictions, and there's a groundwater use restriction in Edwardsville, and we're just going to apply our property to that same restriction that's already available out there. And then construction work and notification, that's just for the people that come out to work on the site. <coughs> and then Amarillo, Illinois has determined that they don't have a use for this property, so we want to bring it back to a reusable thing. So we'll put the property up for sale. Um, the way we work this is we usually go first to the city, to organizations that are around us um, and talk with them first to see if they have any interest or any needs for the property. And what we're looking for for possible reuses is potential green space, could be used for a communal garden um, because we have three foot of soil, we have clean soil. So you can plant a garden on it. It's not gonna hurt, the vegetables are gonna be great. Um, for you, um, and then you know possible re future redevelopment of the property. In this picture here on the on the right, I just wanted to put that up there to let you guys know. Cameron is really working on this whole pollinator, uh, natural plants coming back, and everything else. We believe that the site is an, an, a great opportunity to produce something like that and look forward with something like that. And we're willing to work with somebody to get that accomplished. 
Um, this is the, what I did about 10 years ago. This is the right of way. It's in a conservation area. And we literally planted it all back with all these wildflowers and it blooms all year round. They actually have trails through it. And the conservation does that walks through all these flowers and tells you what all of them are and everything else. So that's uh, something that could possibly be done with this site. So with that, I know I went through it very fast. Last time I gave this, it was two and a half hours and there was a test at the end of it. And to thank the students of Recipia College because they really did not like me at the end. <laughs> so with that, I know I was trying to go through it really fast. <clears throat> Any questions? Anything else? What type of pipes did they use initially? For the MGP sites? They were basically a very mild steel pipe. I mean, we're still seeing them like, so, I mean, this is not the only way we remediate. I mean, probably the most particular way you've seen is they dig a big hole and dig all the dirt off and haul it off site to a landfill. Um, we do that. I mean, in fact, I got a site we're doing that on right now. Um, <clears throat> but just like over one of your neighbors over here, all of them, on that site, because it was similar, it's in, an, it, it, it's in a commercial residential area off of the street that had a lot of bus traffic because MCT drives down Bell Street right there in front of the property, their bus. Our concern was to get out with trucks onto that street and everything else. And at that one, because we had power available from Amman close by, we actually did thermal. So the thermal treatment of the site, we heated the ground up to 212 degrees Fahrenheit for about three years. We drove all the bad stuff off and we run it through what was called the thermal accelerator, which is basically <clears throat> a very fancy name for a chemical incinerator. It operated at around 1400 degrees. Um, so put off water vapor. And we had to test that and make sure that we were putting off just water vapor or nothing else. And we did run that up there and that side we're working on right now, getting it finished and ready uh, to go potential for reuse. The, the, the original, <coughs> the original pipes. Yeah, the original <coughs> pipes in there were mild steel, so it all, okay. we ran into a jungle of them because they had caused a flood and knocked buildings down and they just replaced pipes, so we run into a lot of them, but most of the pipes are rusted pretty badly. Um, what you find is that on this site, we had an oil tar, basically an oil tar separator that was underground, was basically poured. Um, walls and floor similar to what you would see in your basement. And of course the crack occurred around the floor and the side walls. And it probably originally was sealed some way, but over the years, you know, it just leaked and it kind of run down the hill towards Union Street. Um, but there is pipes out there and stuff. I mean, you can still see them, but most of them, if you hit them with an excavator, they just break up. Yeah. They're all rust. <clears throat> So there are 55 sites originally, 27 out of 29 or whatever are basically remediated now. What's the schedule for the other? So our plan, remember when I was telling you about the bill and then on the bottom, our plan right now is to have all those sites completed, any remediation on them by the end of 2023. And right now our schedules show that we're gonna meet that. Yes, sir. Uh, when you were, uh, Finished get through and then far later. Uh, will you be recording the land use controls in the courthouse against the property? Yes, that'll be a D, that'll go on to the D attached to it, the NFR letter and the restrictions. So those will be on the D recorded at the courthouse. We have to do that. That's part of our deal when we get that letter. We have to, within 45 days, um, have it recorded at the city clerk to go on the deed. One last question from Jen. Yes. You mentioned earlier that, uh, that this is a residential facility that people were living in this structure before they made it to the immediately. Were those people tracked to see what kind of exposures they had? Um, for uh, the down the road because of the Yeah, I mean, we did look at that um, and 
we've done some work on that uh, with the Illinois EPA. Um, what we found out was is that in the building proper itself, we didn't detect anything inside the building or outside the building, close to the building, other than the chloroform. And the chloroform is really a not an MGP impact. That's an industrial impact of some type, most likely from, like I said, a pesticide or herbicide. Um, but it was in such a very, very small quantity. You have to understand that when we're looking at remedial objectives, those remedial objectives are assuming somebody lives their whole life there uh, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Um, so when you start looking at this being a rental property and it had a, a solid slab that when we tore it down, the slab was in perfectly good shape. Um, we didn't detect anything inside the house when we did some testing inside. Um, we're pretty, we feel pretty comfortable that the residents in there were not exposed to anything based on what we know. Awesome. Well, thanks, Grant. <laughs> Thank you. I'll give you this on behalf of uh, one nursery. Do you have a 50 50?